everybody. Welcome to the GM's Alcove, the Dash of Alan, my wargaming series here on the channel. Uh, today, I've got a flip through uh, of the rules Bataille Empire or Battle Empire by the author of L'Art de la Guerre. Very similar to each other in layout and format and mm, gameplay. A little bit different, but there are some similarities, and I'll point those out as I go through the flip through today. Uh, this is going to be a two-part series. I will put up a version which puts the entire video up in one go, so you can see that as well later on. Uh, but folks, let's jump into this fantastic set of miniatures rolls. I've been waiting on these for well over a year, and finally they're in my hands. The English version, anyway. Uh, I think originally these are French. Uh, sounds appropriate. But let's get into the rolls. Let's crack that book and see what we're looking at here with Bataille Empire. Well, here we are, Bataille Empire, Battle Empire, Wargaming Rules, Revolution and Empire. I'm going to do a flip through of this. And if you're familiar with L'Art de la Guerre uh, by the same author, uh, this is a very similar, well, it's pretty much the same exact format. I'm bringing L'Art de la Guerre here. You'll see what I mean. I did a video on this, uh, my thoughts on the game. You can find that on my channel as well. But it's pretty much the same format. It's nice gloss pages. So if you are familiar with this layout of a rule book, here you go. That's what you get with Bataille and Pure. Now, let's take a look at this. Let's see how many pages we got here. 256 pages with a rules index. That's nice. It's a two-page index. And nice glossy format. Got a play sheet, of course, that comes with it. Uh, there you can see it right there. Uh, yeah, all the tables and references you need while you're playing the game. And I like this. It's got the page numbers where you can find everything about a particular section of play sheet. So there you go. Two sides. You only get one. I got the photocopy of this. I'm sure you can get copies of this on the website as well as well as some other good stuff like markers which you might want to use for your game so let's take a look at this all right first of all this little introduction there here's your contents uh, fire combat shock rallying skirmishers reserves terrain setting up your battles and so on and so forth now like i mentioned in my vlog post um shackles and bayonets my recent blog post, vlog post, I should say. I talked about this introduction and how well suited it is if you're new to the Napoleonic era or horse and musket era, uh, the history and, and gaming this period of history. Uh, it's got a nice little background material on light infantry, skirmishers, how the troops were armed, what makes up a battalion, how these formations were used in battle. A very general uh, overview of the period and if so if you're unfamiliar with it this is going to come in handy big time and of course you got some nice artwork as well inspiring you to dig into these rules even more talks about formations uh, the rifled muskets the use of the bayonet how infantry were used in combat the effectiveness of squares all that goodness it also does likewise for the cavalry as you can see, as well as the artillery, organization, performance, and so on and so forth. So you're getting quite a few pages here of introduction. Not an overwhelming amount, but enough to whet your appetite and give you a, an idea of what's going on here. So if you're new to this period, this set of rules does have you covered. I'm impressed by this. I like this little addition. Uh, also a little select bibliography. Uh, if you want to take your reference further, it's not a lot here, but you know, it's something. Let me go into presentation of the rule book itself. It talks about game scales. You can play this with any scale miniature, including 28s and 15 mil. I'm not sure which is preferred in these rules. It could go either way with 15 and 28 equally well. Uh, some of the equipment that you'll need, including markers to show that a unit has taken an action, as well as markers to show losses. There is no casualty removal in these rules, much like black powder and some other rules out there. You use little markers to show losses and attrition to your units, and eventually they break and route and are removed from the table. That's pretty much what goes on here. However, keep in mind that units in this game are way smaller, about half the size of black powder units. Uh, and typically in two ranks for infantry. So you're, you're basically working with half as many 
uh, troops, half as many models, and uh, that's a good thing in my book. I've been looking for a set of rules more uh, usable to me, considering my space restrictions, the fact that I want to use 28 mil, and so on and so forth. UDS, of course, UD stands for uh, unit distance. It is the measuring unit we're talking about here, which can be anything from an inch or two inches per UD. It's basically a base width, your infantry base, whatever width that is, whatever frontage it is, that defines what an UD is in the game. And this also is similar to L'Art de la Guerre as well. So if you're familiar with UDs and all that, you know what we're talking about here. Those are the table sizes that you'll need uh, for uh, 28 mil, which is my thing. The minimum table size is about a six by four. Imagine that with 28 mil figures, uh, a little bit smaller for 15 mil. And of course, this assumes you're using the army lists, which allow you to form armies of either 200 points or 300 points. Of course, you can play historical engagements as well. And the table size will be based on the scale of your maps you're converting to your tabletop, etc. What you'd expect. But uh, yeah, typically action markers, when it does something like it shoots or it, uh, shock attacks, it's usually marked with a cloud of smoke, which is a nice little way to represent actions. A unit has taken an action. Then I go into a section called representing your units, what they look like, how many bases, how many miniatures on each base, how you can base your figures. Now this set of rules allows you to use pretty much any basing, even when two armies are based differently you can still play this game. Now, as I mentioned, units are typically four bases for infantry. That's your medium sized unit, the most typical sized unit, regardless of scale of miniatures that you're using, it's four bases in two ranks. Uh, the thing about this, however, uh, it doesn't matter what scale figures you're using to have four bases in your unit. It's always four. Cavalry, it's two. Artillery is one cannon model and skirmishes are represented with two bases per unit uh, that's when they're basically these are detached skirmishers you don't actually represent skirmishers from battalions on the table their, their factors are built into the stats for the battalions uh, let me see here so that's the whole section here talks about base sizes and so on and so forth different ways you can play the game uh, if you want to fight Big battles with few figures, you can do that. If you want to fight small battles with few few figures, you can do that. It's just the rules really have you covered. It's versatile in that respect. In addition, you can play where your infantry are either battalions, known as battalion scale, or regimental, where each unit is actually a regiment of 1,200 men or a couple battalions, basically. And your cavalry are 600 men or four squadrons in this case so you can choose which scale you want to play on based on your table size and what your taste is battalion scale regimental scale there's no changes in the rules whatsoever in fact the only time you're going to be changing anything uh, from what i understand uh, is it's going to be when you're fighting out a battle where one ud on the tabletop is greater than 75 meters of representation scale on your tabletop. When that happens, and that would typically be when you're recreating an historical engagement, that's when you start reducing the shooting ranges uh, that this set of rules uses. Uh, that's pretty much the only time you're going to change anything, really. So, and the same applies if you're going below 30 meters or 30 meters, you'll uh, double your shooting ranges and stuff. That's the only instances where you're going to change anything. Outside of that, regardless of what scale miniature, regardless of what battle scale you're using, battalion or regimental, uh, your UD is going to be approximately 60 meters, and there's no changes in the rules anywhere else. So that's nice. I like that. And we got some illustrations, of course, showing various basing techniques, single rank models. And then we've got double ranked models a la General de Brigade, uh, Black Powder, and so on and so forth. Cavalry can be either two or three figures on a single base. Uh, yeah. So there you go. There's also rules in here on increasing the number of bases in a unit. So if you like big battalions or big regiments, if you want to use the regimental scale, say with uh, black powder sized units or general to brigade sized units, you can do that too with these rules. So it really goes to great lengths to describe how you can use your collection as is 
with the rules. That's nice. Very beneficial. Then it talks about army organization, uh, what the assumption is with the command structure. Typically, if you're playing on the regimental level, which is the default assumed level of the game, where each unit of infantry is a regiment, uh, the first level up in command would be the division. Okay. The next level up would be the core, and your army represents a core. And here's some examples right here of the basing of units. There's your big battalion with lots of figures in it. Normally, this would be your default unit of either four figures on a base or three figures. Uh, and the cavalry, it shows them with the two figures or the three figures. Again, based on how many infantry are on a base and how big the frontage of the base is. Um, infantry and cavalry typically have the same frontage. So, yeah, artillery have a little bit different frontage. So, yeah, there you go. That's that. Then it goes into the section of definitions. It defines all the basic terms used in the game, like what is a unit's front? What is a formed unit? Uh, what does operational distance mean? What is unit orientation? Uh, what defines a flank or rear of a unit? And so on. That's all defined right here. There is grouping of units for movement purposes. If you're familiar with DBX or L'Art de la Guerre, where you can spend a command point, I'll get into that later, to move more than one unit, you can do that in this game. And they're groups. And that's a nice, cool feature to these rules, in fact, the group movement. Very efficient. Uh, let's see what's next. Defines command range, visibility. It talks about game etiquette, which is great if you're a first-time miniatures war gamer. Use of referees, fair play. So you see, the rules are really trying to cater to the new player, not only to the period, but to miniatures gaming in general as well. Nice. That's a very nice touch. Then it goes into the big section here. Troops, how they're defined. What's cohesion points? All units have cohesion points. Uh, what type are they? What's their maneuver class? Skirmish factor. In other words, are there skirmishers attached to this battalion? If so, how good and how many of them are there? That all converts into what's called a skirmish factor. And most units of infantry will probably have this. And it goes from zero all the way up to two. Uh, that defines the quality. SK1, which is skirmisher uh, one, are medium quality. SK0 is poor quality. SK2 is superior quality. And based on that quality, it will help you determine uh, what bonuses you get when you shoot uh, on an enemy unit, so on and so forth. There is morale and status categories, much like you'd see in General the Brigade. Lots of definitions here for the units. I like this. Losses and attrition are two different factors that affect all units. Losses is recorded. Uh, you gotta have a way of recording that with a marker of some sort. Attrition is a separate type of uh, factor on a unit that a unit can receive. Two attrition equals one loss. Uh, tactical doctrine is important, especially when it comes to moving units as a group. Uh, such as mixed order. That means the units that make up that group can be in different formations. Very cool. I see that applying to the French. Deep order, linear order, loose order, and so on and so forth. Special abilities of units. Now, here's where you really have to have get to have fun and define your units. Is there battalion guns attached? Uh, are they fast? Are they lance armed? Are they large sized or small sized? Uh, you know, all these things help better define your battalions or your regiments in the game. And this could apply to cavalry, infantry, and so on and so forth. So these are little additional um, ratings or for your units, basically. And I like this. Are they tenacious? That's cool. Again, the reference here, small size, refers to a unit which is 25% smaller than the medium size or the normal sized unit of four bases. Uh, it's represented as three bases on the tabletop. Large size is represented with six bases and is basically 25% larger than a medium size base. And there's modifiers for that. So you do represent these with more or fewer figures than the medium size. So there is that. Goes into formations, infantry formations of line and column. There's also square, column, square, and full square. There's also detached skirmishers, which is something that is available to light infantry battalions like Leger. Uh, remember, the 
the voltageurs that are part of a battalion aren't represented with models on the table. They're a factor built into the battalion's firing capabilities and, and so on. Uh, that's important to remember. But light infantry battalions, those dedicated to the task of uh, skirmishing, they are represented as models, and this shows you what they look like when they're deployed uh, on the tabletop, skirmishing. And cavalry formations is why I got line and column. Let me go into commanders, how they're represented with their own stats. There is a range, which is their command distance, command ability. So there's your different types or ratings for your commanders. There's five different types, poor, ordinary, competent, brilliant, and strategist. And they have various modifiers and command ranges associated with them on the tabletop. Here's what happens when they're eliminated. Uh, here's how they get involved in combat. They can attach to units and all kinds of things. Uh, here's how they move on the tabletop and so on and so forth. What happens when they're lost? Are they replaced? That's all covered in here. Ah, and then we get into the sequence of play. Probably one of my favorite parts of this game is the sequence of play. Now, there's two different types of sequences you can choose to use. One is a simplified sequence, which is described here. It's recommended for beginners to the game. And then there's the standard sequence. And let's take a look at the standard sequence. First of all, the game turn is made up of three basic steps. One, strategic phase. Two, uh, division activation phase and finally the end of game turn now you'll see that the division activation phase is made up of five uh, steps starting with the tactical command followed by preparatory fire followed by charges and shock combat after that's resolved you go to movements and rallying of units and finally the final fire that's where units get to fire in earnest uh, once that's done the next division takes an activation and so on and so forth to all the divisions have activated or had the chance to do so and the game turn ends we go to the next game turn that's the basic structure of the game turn uh, basically your simplified sequence does away with division orders uh, that's the main difference because the orders system that this game uses very much like general to brigade uh, can add some complexity uh, to the gameplay um, I intend to jump right into it, though. I love the way the order system works. If anybody knows me, I love General the Brigade, and one of the reasons is because of this fantastic orders system it has. Fantastic if you play solo, and great if you have friends to play, and, you know, that kind of thing. This set of rules has that. It has an orders system. Fantastic. Based on the orders that a division has, and we'll get into the orders, uh, that determines when a unit or a division activates. See, divisions activate, and based on their orders, they follow a strict order here. First ones are divisions that have orders to retreat. They're all done first during the division activation phase. Once that's done, all units, all divisions that are on maneuver orders are activated. Next, all divisions on attack orders are activated. That's followed by all divisions under engage orders. And finally, all divisions under hold orders are the last to activate. So your orders dictate when a division activates. Now, if both sides have a division, uh, there's an initiative role, division initiative. That would have to be checked. So, yeah, this kind of forces the players into a kind of uh, structure that was part of Napoleonic battles. You know, it kind of uh, represents that. And it does also with that, with a sequence that divisions must follow as well. When they're activated, uh, here's what they can do. All the units within that division uh, can take preparatory fire. That's, that's basically skirmishes and artillery. That's where they fire in preparation for other actions to be taken. Once the division units have finished doing that, and the, the commander chooses which units are doing what as he goes down the line here. Next is charges and shocks. They're all carried out and resolved. Once they're done, we go to movements and rallying. Once they're all done, we go to final fire. Once that's done, we go to the next division or end the turn if there's no divisions left to activate. So there's a strict order that units take actions based on what the division commander or the player wants to do with those units. So you got your preparatory fire followed by shock combat, followed by movement and rallying. And finally, units just sitting around can open up and fire. 
And that's the sequence that a division follows when it activates. Uh, action markers, when you do certain things like uh, shoot during final fire, for instance, you, you get an action marker. Remember that little cloud of smoke? Uh, that shows that it's taken an action. It's committed to an action. It doesn't mean it can't do anything later in the turn, but it means that if it does, for, for instance, reaction firing and that sort of thing, which this game has, it will be penalized because it took that action, an action earlier in the turn. Uh, that's what the action marker is there to remind you of. Not just that it is finished or done for the turn, because by all means it's not. So that's what action markers are for, and they have all kinds of fun things and effects on play. Typically a penalty when they try to do anything more during the turn. At the end of that turn, all those action markers are removed. Uh, you would only ever have one. Now we go into command, how it works, what the orders are, and I just kind of hinted at what they were. If you're familiar with General Order Brigade, same kind of wording and format to the orders here. It tells you what units have to do, what they cannot do. Uh, for instance, attack at least half of the units in good order, uh, as opposed to disordered. Must make a full move towards the enemy, or objective, or charge, or volley fire at effective range. Cavalry within charge range must charge. So, and then it goes into the specific details of how that would apply in specific situations. You got engage, you got hold, and so on and so forth. Uh, what happens when units have achieved their orders? Do they default to something? Typically it's uh, hold, that kind of thing. And there's little markers you place the divisions, uh, usually upside down at the start of the turn. When you change your orders, you can place them next to the division commander hidden, uh, and so on and so forth, not revealing them until the division activates to reveal what it is. Uh, you can also fake out the opponent by placing uh, false orders that really don't mean any change. You're just placing it next to your division. Now, before we go any further, now is the time to point something out. And I'm excited about this part of the game, and I know a lot of my friends are as well. If you like DBX, DBM, DBA, L'Art de la Guerre, all that sort of stuff, you might be familiar with player initiative points. Pips, if you will. Basically, you roll a dice, modify it, perhaps, and it results in a number of points. In this case, we're going to call them command points. Those command points are used by the commander to do certain things in the game. Uh, this game has that. It has an element of pips usage. They're called command points. At the start of every turn, the commander-in-chief, uh, typically your core commander or army commander, he's going to roll a d6, modify it by his ability, and the result is going to be used for him to change orders of his division. If the division is within his command distance, it costs 1 CP. If it's outside of his command distance, it's 2 CP. And that's the general rule to it, and I'll explain that in a moment. So it's either one CP or two. So if he wants to change a division's orders from, say, hold to engage, it's going to cost him one CP to do that, or two if that division is out of range. Uh, that's how that works. That's how the army general changes orders and how he uses CP. Now, he can also use those CP to give to his division commanders. Why, you might ask? Because when a division is chosen to activate, it immediately rolls its own D6, adds its command ability, plus any bonus CPs from his higher up, the general. Uh, that total is what that division commander has in CP to activate his units with. I can cost a CP to activate a unit to uh, move or to shoot or to engage in shock. If the unit is out of command range of the divisional commander, it will cost two CP. And again, that's kind of the theme here. It either costs one CP or two. One if he's within range, two if he's out of range. It's easy to remember, and it pretty much applies throughout the rules, um, determining how, how much something costs to do. So that's how units are activated individually to do things within their divisional orders. Uh, so your army commander uses his CP to help his divisional commanders by giving them CP, as well as changing orders 
uh, of the division and some other things. The divisional commander, he uses his CP, including those given to him by the army general, to activate his units to do all kinds of cool things, from shock attacking, charging, shooting, rallying, all that good stuff. And how much CP something costs is pretty much based on the distance that unit or division is from the commander uh, using the CP. So yeah, that's how that works. I just wanted to point that out now it's an important part of the game. Here's where it talks about it, in fact. Command points. Basically, it's the CP equals a D6 plus the value of the commander divided by 2. And I believe you round up or down. I don't know what it is. Round it up. So if you're familiar with L'Art de la Guerre, it works in a very similar way. Uh, that determines your CP that you have for the turn and what you can use. There you go, folks. That's the end of part one. I'm going to cover the remainder of the flip through, which starts with movement and goes into combat, and shooting, the army lists, all that goodness. We're going to take care of that in part two. In the meantime, folks, thanks for watching. Leave me some comments, some feedback on this flip through. Let me know if you want to see more of these. Uh, like, share, comment, all that. As always, folks, you guys hang in there. It's only going to get better. Take care, folks.